let's uh, pick back up kind of where we left off. And I hope we'll have a little bit of discussion time maybe at the end. And um, so Mike, if you could go ahead and, and bring that one up to the screen. Yes, and I, I hope I'm, I'm not a master. Uh, I am not a master with the, uh, with the slides and PowerPoints. It looks a little bit different on my screen than what I anticipated. But if the colors aren't too pleasant, uh, please forgive me. But last time we were talking about why change doesn't happen, there were, I think, uh, four or five that we discussed here. Uh, I think Donnie had mentioned the worldly cares. And that, that is so easy that we get caught up with the things of life and with even the blessings of life that we're just satisfied with the status quo and where things are. Um, we talked about unforgiveness, and, and I put that, that is not a deliberate misspelling. I put unforgiveness, um, that it's, unforgiveness is where we do not forgive other people, and unforgiveness is where we do not embrace or accept our own, our own forgiven status with God. And I think many times we find it in both situations. Um, our desires for control, our patterns and our habits. And I wanted to add a few more in here that had kind of come to my attention. If you look over on the left, or excuse me, the right side of the screen, one of our, our struggles with is that we, as human beings, want to be accepted. Um, we want to... I guess, for lack of a better word, fit in. We want other people to like us. And sometimes we don't change because we may fear that we are not accepted. Um, how many times have we spoken to someone or heard someone say that they would come to Christ or would consider um, becoming serious in a matter of faith, but they're afraid of how their friends would respond or how their um, their spouses would respond. And so there are many things involved with that. What about past failures? Um, I've tried this before and it didn't work. I heard a while back that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, hoping for a different result. And, um, and I think I have been guilty of that many times in things other than spiritual matters, uh, as well as in spiritual matters. Just plain old out and out, I guess we could say us old timers, uh, just plain blatant sin. Sometimes people don't want to change because they do not want to give up whatever sin is in their life that is hindering the work that God is doing. And, and they have a sense or a feeling that I can't give this up. Or also, there could be a sin there that is unconfessed and, and is um, being a pattern in their life. And as a result, that is hindering the change that God is wanting to do and God is wanting to work in them and in us. Now, um, the other thing is the cost. Jesus told... Um, the disciples to count up the cost. And he gave several references to that in parables and, and so forth. Um, is there something that it's going to cost us to change? Um, how many people have experienced a situation where that there was a job involved um, and might even be uh, a step that would, uh, would decrease salary to follow in God's, in God's instruction or God's leading. And the last one I'm going to mention there is just, is, um, just an addiction. And I, when I'm saying just an addiction, I'm not diminishing that or anything, but just a plain, simple addiction. Sometimes those things get in the way of the changes that we see. I know um, many times I can think of as a, as a young Christian, as a young kid, growing up in church and you'd see people come to a revival. It might be a person who was an alcoholic and they would come to a revival and, and make a profession of faith. But yet because of their weakness and their addiction, they believed that nothing had happened. 
because when they left church, you know, they, the next weekend, they were struggling with the same addiction. And, and those things are legitimate and they are true and they do hold a lot of strong power that can, can really hold us back in what God is working. But God is faithful and God is able to break the chains of addiction. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, I actually had this one on there the last time and because of um, an editing error, it wouldn't show. Is change possible? Again, back to the question we had before. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And if you do a little bit of word study back on there, depending on the translation that you're looking at, the word uh, translated as creation may be translated as creature. And I think this is the new King James that I have here. And the emphasis here is on the process or the act of creating um, more than even the act of the being that is created, if that makes sense. In other words, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or he is newly created. So it's an active word. And as Christ is creating us, as God is changing us as believers in Christ and making us more like him, I think it's a good thing for us to remember that, that this is a process that God is doing and that he is not, um, not abandoning us in our state that we're in, and, but that he is continuing the work that he started. I think about Peter when I think about um, about the process of change. Remember, you remember what he started out as, and remember where he ended up. He started out as a, as an impulsive, um, I guess, almost a, a ready for a fight kind of guy, and he ended up um, dying. Uh, at least according to church history, he was crucified on the cross upside down because he didn't feel worthy to suffer the same death as Christ. And so that's the story that we have about it. But, um, but God was continually working in Peter's life to make him more like, uh, like Christ. Now, as we go on down with the change that God's working on us, I want us to focus on a couple of things here. Um, biblical change is based on a transformation. And if we can move on to the next one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now notice verse two, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you would be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I went back into this uh, from last week to kind of uh, connect it together. Now, how God changes us, of course, we all know the first step is a miraculous new birth. And if you notice in verse two there, the change um, methodology, I guess you could say, for, for lack of a better word, is the renewing of your mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the focus here on this verse is that not only is there a miraculous new birth, but that there is a continued renewal of our minds. And that continued renewal of our mind is the process that I would like to focus on tonight. And we'll focus uh, a few minutes on this, and then we will open up for some discussion and, and get some input and some sharing from those in attendance online. Now, I want to look at a, a little model that I kind of put together um, earlier. And this model reflects 
what I see as the pattern of, of our mind and what God is working through to renew our mind, if that, if that makes sense in saying it that way. We all have beliefs and our beliefs affect our thoughts and our thoughts affect our feelings. But our feelings also affect our beliefs. And I'll get into that in just a moment. And ultimately, these things all roll out to affect our actions and our behavior. Do any of us ever do anything and we really don't know why we did it? I catch myself doing that quite often. Um, sometimes I think, why in the world did I do that? At the time, I thought it was a good idea. Or at the time, I felt this certain way. And because I felt this certain way, I had this action. And the resulting action, sometimes I'm pleased with and sometimes I'm not. Uh, is it Romans chapter 8 where Paul talks about that struggle? Um, or is it chapter 9 that, I, that what I would do, I don't do, and that what I do, I don't want to do. And, and he went through a whole struggle there of the conflict. And I think the summary was the wretched man that I am or something like that he said in the end. But I want to focus just a moment on this. Um, our beliefs. Our beliefs are what we accept and believe to be true. Um, our thoughts are filtered through those beliefs. And when we, when we think a thought and we have thoughts that, that come up in our minds and we are having them all throughout the day, they are generally based on the beliefs and the things that we have experienced and, and had in our mind. Now, sometimes though, we begin to find out that we base our beliefs on our feelings. Have we ever experienced that? I don't believe that God has forgiven me because I don't feel forgiven. Um, I don't think God has forgiven me because I don't feel forgiven. I don't think or I don't believe that my parents love me because of A, B, C, or D. So these things can affect us in many different ways. And I guess the model that I could have made here, and I thought about doing that, was making it also a triangular type model to where they would go back and forth and interchange with each other. But generally, the approach I want to take with this is this. When we have a belief and... I'm going to start out with just a simple example, okay? Uh, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if we come into agreement with God about that sin, what does the Bible say that God will do? He will forgive us. That is, that is a promise in God's word that rests upon that. Now, when we take that belief and we filter that belief through our thoughts, then some things begin to happen. Well, I don't think that I really, truly, honestly repented of that like I should. Have you ever heard anyone say that? Did I really, really, really mean it? Or do I feel guilty? Or did, did I say that and ask God for forgiveness for the wrong reason? Did I do that because I felt guilty? Did I do that or do that because I was caught? Or did, am I really, really sorry? So when we get into those kinds of things, even though we have a belief that may be true, then we get those thoughts that we're struggling with. What's going to happen to our feelings? Of course, our feelings will also be filtered through those thoughts, even though our belief is correct. Now, I'm going to go back to another. Um, if 
I believe John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16 clearly teaches me that God loves the whole world, that he gave his son for all of us. So my belief in that is ultimately that God loves me. But my thought is, I am not worthy of that love. I don't deserve that love. And so therefore, my feeling will be, does I don't feel loved. Now, while my thought is true, yes, I am not worthy of that love. If I go back to my belief, and I think about, yes, I'm not worthy of that love, but that has nothing to do with God loving me. God loves me because he's God, and that's what he does, not because I deserve it. So do you see, there's an interaction with those beliefs. And as we believe something, as we believe something, we, we are complex beings. And Pastor Greg could elaborate a whole lot more on the the body, soul, and spirit, and the trichotomy of our human being, and, and I may turn that over to him at some point here and just ask him to have at it, but th so this, this does get kind of complicated, but in the results of all of these, as they influence one another in our lives, then the result is the actions that we can see on the outside. Um, I see many times that kids at school, teenagers, act in certain ways and it just does not make sense. But behind a lot of those actions are beliefs, thoughts, and feelings that, that come up. Now, another thing I would point out to you is this, that we tend to think of what we do with our actions, that something happened and I reacted to it, but in the middle of all of those actions are our beliefs and our thoughts and our feelings. Now, I'm going to move on a little bit here. And we're going to address each of these in an order. Now, our beliefs. Um, I've got a Bible reference here that I want to look at regarding our beliefs. And that is John chapter 8, verse 31 through 32. Mike, if you want to click on, that one should pop up there, I hope. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, um, I'll share a little bit of something in here of why I was talking about a minute ago that I think this is life-changing. Um, I've, I've uh, gave testimony before at church and, and some of you may have been there when I've shared this and some of you may have not. Um, I went through a period of time a few years back, I guess you could um, probably call it maybe a crisis of faith. I don't know if that was, would be the exact right word. It was, was definitely a crisis, but um, in that time period, what I did is I needed to search and really find out what God was like. And what I came to realize is that, that the God that I had experienced all of my life was not truly the God according to scripture. And the way that I addressed this is I wanted to find out what he was really like. And the best place I could find was to look in the book of John. And I started looking at the person of Jesus. And so if Jesus is God come in the flesh, he is the incarnation of the word of God. Then if we want to find God's personality, um, God's character, how God truly relates to us as human beings and mankind, then what we could look at the book of John and really do a study 
upon the person of Jesus Christ. And I think we would find the true heart of God in that. And that's ultimately what I did. And what I found was this, that there were, were many contradictions in my own life through my beliefs and my actions that did not match up to scripture. And here would be an example. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now, did coming to Christ make me free or put me in bondage? That was my question. Did it make me free or did it put me in bondage? Yeah, well, we are the bond servants of Christ, aren't we? We are his servants, but at the same time, the liberty that is there as being free from sin, as being free from the curse of the law, uh, for us as believers in Christ does give us freedom. I'll give you another example of what I experienced. One of the verses that was really, really um, important to me, um, I want to say, you all can probably help me with this, is it Matthew chapter 8, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? I will give you rest. In my life, many times what I found is I came to Christ and instead of rest, I found stress. The problem was not Christ. The problem was not the scripture. The problem was my belief in how I was addressing what the scripture was saying and how that I was approaching it. And so as I began to look at that, I said, wait a minute, there's a contradiction there between what I believe and how I am living out what God's word says and what God is actually saying and what he is asking me to do as a believer in Christ. And so Jesus said to them, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So for us as believers in Christ, the first thing we need to do is we need to learn exactly what the Bible says. And that truth is not a threat to us. That truth is freedom to us as believers in Christ. Now, Mike, if you'll click on, um, what do we need to learn? Well, God's person and character. I think that is one of the things, um, you know, I, I know all the, or I don't know everything theologically, but I know the basic theological truths, you know, God's omnipresence, God's omnipotence, um, all of those kinds of things, God never changes, you know, the kind of things that we teach in basic theology, I'm, I'm familiar with that, and, and I think I think pretty understanding of those but the actual character of God. Um, I know that God is good, but what does that actually mean? And how does that impact me as a person in my daily life and in the struggles that I'm facing on a daily basis and in my questions and my doubts and my worries and my fears? How does that really impact and how does that really make a change in those kinds of things that I face. You know, where is God in the middle of my suffering? Where is God in my depression? Where is God in my anxiety? Where is God in my mourning, in my loss? Where is God in the middle of my sickness? Where is God in the middle of my anger? Where is God in the middle of, I don't want to say it, but my hatred? You know, and then when I begin to look at those kinds of things, God's personal person and character and what we believe to be true about God on even a deeper level than, than the theological, even a personal theological level in what we believe to be true about God, that affects how we think, that affects how we feel, and that affects how we act as Christians. And I think that we can see that as I look back on it even more, 
the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the different people that Jesus came in contact with, uh, the people who felt unworthy to even be a part of the synagogue or the, the temple that didn't feel worthy to even go. Jesus addressed those people and Jesus reached out to them in compassion. So does that mean that the God, that the temple was his habitation, was not reaching out to them and they were not, not welcome to come and seek him in his sanctuary? No. No, it did not mean that. But that's how it was understood. So the next one, God's work in our lives. What do we believe about God's work in our life? What is God doing? What is God's goal? In my life, what's God's objective? You know, uh, some people think that, that God's goal or God's objective in their life is to take everything that's enjoyable away from them. Some people think that the opposite, that God's goal, goal in their life is to, to give them a free reign on pleasure and forgiveness. But what, do, what is God really trying to do? What's he really trying to work? in our lives and what's he trying what is what is his his motivation i guess you could say um how we think god sees us how we think god sees us how does god see us does god see me as an undesirable person that he has to accept, that he has to, um, I guess, let in because he made a promise and he made a commitment and he stuck to it. Is that how God sees me? Or does God see me as, some, as someone that he desired to have a relationship with and desired to have fellowship and communion with that is a creature? Uh, cre a of his hand of creation and that he longs to bring into fellowship with him even though there is nothing desirable about me yet God still does that because that's what he is and that's who he is um, how we see ourselves how we see ourselves where do I see myself in God's plan where do I see myself in his thoughts and in his work, um, how do I see God's work in my own life? That's very, very important. And finally, how we see others. How do we see other people? Our beliefs are going to affect all of those. Our beliefs are going to affect how we see God's person and character, how we see God's work in our lives, how we think God sees us, how we see ourselves, and ultimately how we see other people. And as we think about these, if our beliefs are not based on biblical truth, then think about what it is like for a follower or a professing Christian when these things are out of, um, out of alignment or are going in the wrong direction. Um, it can affect many, many things within our faith and also within how we interact with other people. Okay, let's go on down to the next one. Let's go to our thoughts. Our thoughts. Um, Isaiah chapter 55, verse eight through nine. The Lord says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, if God's thoughts are so much above our thoughts, how can we bring our thoughts in alignment with God's thoughts? It all goes back 
to what we believe. It all goes back to what we believe and what we know to be true. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, one of the, I think one of the most um, practical passages we have on, on our thoughts in scripture. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy meditate on these things well that kicks out about 90 percent of my thought life <laughs> well right you look at the news what what things occupy our mind what things occupy our mind right now and and if you think about that if you think about your thoughts you know there there's not much that we come in contact with on a daily basis that enables us to go that route. So what this is going to do, it's going to take a conscious decision. Do we ever have thoughts that we don't like? And I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about just sinful, you know, uh, lustful or necessarily thoughts like that. Um, even, and you know, all of us struggle with thoughts we're, we're not proud of regardless of the situation, but even outside of the ones that we think we generally think of as being wicked, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We know the thoughts that we think of that are wicked, that are unholy, that are ungodly, but yet there are many thoughts that cross our mind throughout the day, uh, throughout living, that are things that are just away from the direction that God wants to take our minds. I guess that's what I'm trying to say in here. And in Philippians chapter four, verse eight, I think it tells us very plainly here the direction that God wants to take our mind to and that he wants to guide our minds to. Now, on our feelings, um, I, it was very interesting moving on to our feelings. That is that the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about our feelings, does it? Or does it? I look, when you, if you take a concordance, I took my big, thick, strong concordance and looked up feelings, and there were probably only three or four references to feelings in, in the Bible. And not many of those are really addressing the feelings like we say. Now, what we do see is that the Bible teaches a lot about specific emotions and emotional reactions. It does do that, but generally on the word feelings, the Bible does not address those in a, I guess you could say in a um, global or a, a inclusive fashion. Does that, does that make sense? Um, while it does speak about anger, it speaks about about envy, it speaks about jealousy, speaks about hatred, love, uh, about any emotion you could possibly imagine the Bible addresses, but it doesn't lump them all into one big sum very often in speaking about it. First John chapter two says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. So that expresses and focuses on our love. Uh, Philippians chapter four, very familiar passage again on our emotions. Rejoice. That's an emotion I'd like to stick with. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And going down to the next one, Mike, verse five says, let your gentleness be known to all men the lord is at hand and verse six this one is familiar be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to god and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts through jesus christ or christ jesus now so here we have our thoughts our beliefs our thoughts and our feelings 
And what does the, I want you to, I want to take a moment here. Let me say it that way. I want to take a moment here and open it up for a little, just a very brief discussion on what thoughts or feelings does the Bible give guidance on? Um, I'd like to open it up and why don't y'all just throw us out a few? I mentioned a few there. Anyone want to share any? What, what thoughts or what feelings does the Bible talk about or give us guidance on? Talks about grief. Grief, absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Another one. Scripture gives us uh, insight on anger. Mm -hmm. Be not angry, be angry and sin not, etc. Another? I know the Psalms are filled with with um, the interplay with the emotional. I, I think of Psalm 143 particularly, but uh, sadness, depression, um, you know, a whole array of things. Uh, fretfulness, which would be anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a whole array of, of things that the Psalm the Psalms actually dive into as it relates to our feelings. Any others? Uncertainty. Yes. What about fear? Does the Bible ever talk about fear? I believe about almost every other statement Jesus made to his disciples was fear not, wasn't it? He said that a lot of times. I'm, I'm probably exaggerating there. but um, Of course, I mentioned hatred, envy. Frustration. What was that? Frustration. Frustration. Is the word frustration in the Bible? Don't think so. But it, it's a lot of times in the Bible used like with anger, isn't it? With the question, why? why? Oh, yes. Good point, Donnie. Yeah. I, I think one of the big ones is the, the, the issue that the scripture gives us one. And it's firmer than a feeling, but it does affect our feelings. And that's the issue of hope. I was thinking the same thing. What about peace? And I think back to what Donnie was saying. Donnie, that was a really good point on that. Uh, I think back to what Donnie was saying. While it doesn't talk specifically about frustration, I was actually just thinking about that. Does the Bible use the word frustration? Don't think it does. But we are told continually to be patient. And frustration is, of course, the opposite of being patient, isn't it? And um, any others real quickly? Okay, now I'm gonna go on to the next one, next part of this. What belief causes that feeling to be acted upon in a negative or sinful manner? Does that make sense? I hope it does. What, uh, let's go back here and I'll, I'll make it, I hope I'll make it um, makes sense. If you look at something, um, for instance, you look at um, you look at love. Can love be acted upon in a negative manner? It can be. Um, Greg has talked about the different types of love, and um, in several different passages. And um, so we can take that in a negative or a sinful manner, 
But on, on this one, what I'm, I guess what I'm more thinking about is um, like Donnie was mentioning about frustration or about patience. What belief is it that would cause us to have to act in frustration rather than patience? What belief is it that would cause us to act in hate rather than love? What would belief in would it be that would cause us to act in strife um, rather than peace? You see what I'm saying? The well, psalmist, uh -huh. the psalmist often mentioned, why do the wicked prosper? That's oh. frustration. And the disciples in the New Testament expressed it um, when when they didn't understand what was it. It'd be harder for a rich man to get into heaven than the camel through the eye of a needle. They said, "Wait a minute. Our belief is that if God, you're in God's favor, that you will be blessed with stuff." And so that was frustrating to them. They didn't understand it. Exactly. Donnie, you're, you're hitting exactly on what I'm talking about there. Thank you so much. Yes, they believed that because somebody was, was rich, that they had God's favor and God's hand and God's blessing upon them, and therefore they had to have God's approval. Yes, that's, that's exactly, exactly what, I'm, what I'm talking about there. Um, okay. So think about those, and we think about those. There are beliefs that, that cause us to act um, or that motivate us to act, I guess you could say. It's not a devil made me do it kind of thing, but, but we do have beliefs that motivate us to act in a negative way. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. If someone is unkind to, to the poor, Jesus talked continually about being... Um, being kind to the poor and and how we address other people or being kind to sinners, how that Jesus responded to them. So if we have the thought or the belief that we are better than them in some for some reason or another, then the way we respond to them will be affected. So let's move on. And making way for God to, to work change. I want, to, I want to just kind of finish things up on this tonight. How can we make way for God to work change in these three areas of our life? Um, our beliefs. How can we make way for God to, to work change or for God to do change in us? Uh, our beliefs, we can identify our false beliefs and seek the truth of God's word. Embrace the truth, learn it, repeat it, and pray it. I think, Greg, I think one of the greatest things that I've learned um, from Pastor Greg that's, uh, that's helped me personally is this. Lord, right now, I don't feel loved, but I know that you love me. And I'm holding on to your promise that you love me regardless of what my mind is telling me right now. You know, those kinds of things. Um, identify our false belief and seek the truth. Um, Lord, I know that you are good. The situation that I'm seeing right now, there's not a lot of good that I can see in this situation, but God, I know you're right in the middle of it, and I know you're good. Our thoughts, identify the thoughts that are not based on truth. Confront the thought and pray the truth. Um, the thoughts are, I don't think God forgave me. What is the truth? Well, the truth says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Lord, I don't think, my mind is telling me that you didn't, but I prayed and I ask you for forgiveness and I'm trusting in the truth of your promises. Our feelings are where we can work a lot with this. Identify feelings that result from our false beliefs or our irrational thoughts. Pray the truth and embrace God's promises in spite of how you feel. Lord, I don't feel loved, but I know you love me. Your word says you love me. And so as we fill our minds with those thoughts 
and those, uh, those thoughts and those beliefs that we know to be true, what we will find, it may not happen instantly, but the more we do that, we will find that our feelings will change. As we embrace the truth, we will fi find that our thoughts change and begin to change. And we will find that all of these will begin to line up more in alignment with God's word. But it takes some effort and it takes, um, it takes prayer. And I don't want to oversimplify it, but really in a lot of ways, it is that simple. That we embrace the truth and the truth will do what? Set you free. Now, uh, the next slide is one that Pastor Greg, I think, has used before, and I'd like to invite Pastor Greg to finish us up on commenting on this one. Would you do that, Pastor Greg? I, I, I can throw something in there. Uh, this, this, is a, uh, this is how you change the way you feel, basically, um, because you, and you so wonderfully put this the correlation between what we believe and I, I just i've just jotted down some thoughts from what you, your lesson and that is what we believe is what we stand on as being true whether it is true or not whether it is perceived or something we perceive and i'll give you an example you know you think about you think about uh, worry and can be based on a lot of times the the feelings of fear and the what ifs when you run those scenarios out and worry is really a negative meditation um, you can think something you can think something that is not true and then act upon it um, you know how many times have we have you ever jumped to conclusions <laughs> you know about things in life so I, one of the things that that I, I think spot on here Ed, is that our, our 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 thinking is 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 so important that we correspond our thinking with truth and and the bible speaks so much about this i've got a book matter of fact i i went for it it's called biblical meditation this is a rob morgan book but you know the eastern the eastern way of meditation is like you empty yourself and biblical meditation is just the opposite you actually fill your mind with truth and i i'm finding out more and more the older i get in the in my Christian life, the more I realize I need it. I need the truth of, of God. So it's so important that we meditate. We just can't be on a, like a spiritual autopilot um, when it comes to our thought life. You really have to be on top of what it is you're thinking. You have to say, is it true? That's difficult today because we're inundated with so much information and data. Um, we are living in the information age. I, I think it's it's probably more incumbent upon us even now more than ever to fill our minds with truth. And so how do you do that? You think on the things that are above. You set your focus on things above. And that is a process. And that process is one that is so important. Um, and as you change your thinking, then it will eventually, and, and then you begin to act upon truth and live truth. Eventually, you get the big bus turned around. It turns around. Um, your feelings are usually the last to change, but they, they do change. Um, so for, for our Christian life and our, our own growing in the Lord, I'll put it that way, it, it's really important that we are actively engaged with the scripture, not just on Sundays, but we are actively engaged with it day in and day out. And this comes along to actually challenge us on why we believe what we believe at times. 
like you said, is there, you know, what's the basis of truth for it? Um, I think of a lot of folks today who are, for instance, who, who would say, well, you know, I've tried praying and I, I, God doesn't answer my prayer or, um, um, you know, they're just dis- find themselves disappointed with God. And what they may be disappointed with is they're disappointed in their concept of God. It may not be, it may not be the reality of God's nature at all, but they're disappointed in the God that they assumed uh, him to be. Um, so it's so important that we grow and we learn and we conform our thinking um, to the reality of, of uh, who Christ is. And, and Jesus is that, um, that we don't need to be morbidly introspective, but we do need to be thinking the truth. And for somebody that deals with worry, like I do at times, and for folks who live in fear, you, you really have to, to sit down and say, okay, what's the truth? and conform your thinking to that. They say it takes 21 days to change a habit. And I think it does probably, and sometimes maybe even longer because uh, of the thought processes that are involved in what we habitually do, how we you know, habitually respond to life situations, et cetera. Um, so this idea of, of change is, is possible it's slow, it's not in accordance the way as we as Americans think it ought to be, (laughs) because, you know, we think it ought to be instant, and what we find is that you said the word, I think, Ed, so wonderfully, and that is the process of the, the process of growing involves the renewing of our mind. It always has always will and I think it is again I'm going to just say it one more time it's imperative that in this day of information age that that we are grounding our beliefs in in what is true and what is holy and what is right that's all my thoughts Ed in your mercy lord we thank you that you love us lord you've made it we're fearfully and wonderfully made um but lord sometimes we are complex beings and as such sometimes it's uh it's difficult for us to embrace the simplicity of the gospel message and let you do your powerful work in our lives like you would have to do Father, I just pray that you take this uh, little lesson, Lord, that we shared with tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd use it somewhere, somehow, to make a difference in someone's life. And Lord, we know you do because it's your your word. And we love you and we thank you. We pray, Lord, you keep us safe. Lord, uh, again, touch those requests that were mentioned. And we just pray that you bring us back together as is in your will. In Jesus' name, amen.